Listen, you, you want to be in church where, you're, where your children are not just playing games. And they're, they're not just seeing little stories. Where they're actually learning the, the Word. Because with the Word, you find out who Jesus is. When you find out who Jesus is, you find out what love is, what peace is, what joy is. You find out what power is. Kids who understand and know Jesus, listen, we might think Christmas is all about the kids and all that stuff. But it's really about the perfect gift that came to our life. The perfect gift. That if we will unwrap that perfect gift, we will know things that there is no way that we could know because life hasn't taught it to us. There are people who were raised in, in bad homes. I mean, like where all kinds of stuff went on. And they come to meet Jesus, and without any knowledge of really how to be uh, a mom or a dad or how to be uh, a, the right kind of husband or the right kind of wife, with Jesus, they instinctively know how to do it because there is a different spirit inside of the person. Now, I want to read a verse out of uh, James chapter 1 for you. This is one of my favorites. It's every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. and comes down from the Father of lights with whom... There is no variation or shadow of turning. So with God, he sends down every good gift and every perfect gift. And when God sends that gift down, it says there's no variation. There's no shadow of turning. God doesn't even turn. When he gives you the gift, he doesn't even turn just a little bit and say, man, why would I give him that gift? He doesn't, he doesn't step back a little bit and go, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe those angels, they talked me into giving that gift, and yeah, maybe they were wrong. God gave us the gift of his only begotten son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It doesn't get any gooder than that. It's the perfect gift if you are in any situation of life it is the perfect gift now it caught my attention in reading that verse and analyzing what was said there perfect gift and I kept thinking Lord man there there are a few things in life that are perfect few things. In fact, I really can't name anything as perfect. I'm kind of a, I don't know if I can even say this in church. I'm kind of an anal retentive type of person. When it comes to doing things, like if, if I do a project at the house, it has got to be finished and it's got to be perfect. And it makes me crazy if something is out of whack. You know, just a little bit. We used to, uh, Ed and Durbeck and I used to wallpaper houses. And one of my worst fears is that the wallpaper wouldn't look right because we were getting paid to do it. So we would hang this wallpaper up. We went to this house over in Reading. It, it, was, a, it was a newer house. And this lady, this uh, interior decorator, had hired us to, to put this wallpaper up. Well, I had the kitchen. And in the kitchen, it was kind of an open thing, but it had a, a soffit up above the cabinets. I thought, man, I'll knock this out in no time at all. She had the paper sitting there for us. I thought, piece of cake, man, I am good. Well, the... The paper had stripes that were vertical, stripes that were horizontal, and then stripes that were diagonal. 
And I start putting this stuff up. And, and I'm going. And I, I get from this end, I get all the way over to this end. I had to come around a bend down. I'm going around another corner. And I, I start to go there. And, and my horizontal stripes are not horizontal. My vertical stripes are now crooked. And my crooked stripes are almost flat. And, and I'm going, man, what is wrong with this? So I get frustrated. I rip it off the wall, and I, and I start over with some new pieces, and I'm rearranging. And finally I said, I said, Ed, what is wrong with this mess? He said, I don't know. Man, I spent like eight hours just trying to do this little piece that should have taken me a few minutes. The wall wasn't straight. He finally said, let's measure the soffit. I said, okay. It's supposed to be 12, 12 inches, you know, ceiling to the bottom. We start out 12 inches. We get to that corner I had to go around. Yeah, 12 and a half. We get down over here, 11 and three quarters. We get down over here, we're back to 12 and a half. By the time we get over here, we're 12 and a quarter. And, and back to 11 something. Things aren't perfect in life. And you got to learn how to cope. You're thinking, how do I cope with stripes going all different directions? <laughs> I made every stripe not straight. <laughs> but it made my brain just tilt because I, I couldn't make it straight. It wasn't perfect. Well, you know, life is not perfect. We cannot get it to be perfect. We can't. We only have one hope of having things turn out the way that we need it to turn out, and that's Jesus. God will do everything perfect in his time. Now, there's an interesting set of verses, and you guys have heard these verses a bunch of times. 1 Corinthians Chapter 13, the love chapter. That chapter is so full of love, when you open it up, it just is greasy. But he says here, love suffers long in his kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they'll fail. Whether there are tongues, they'll cease. Whether there is knowledge, it'll vanish away. Then he starts into saying something here. For we know in part... We prophesy in part. We do all kinds of things in part. And he gives us this one thing. But when that which is perfect has come. When that which is perfect has come. Then all the stuff that we knew in part will vanish away. Well, that which is perfect has come. That which is perfect came in the package of a little baby at Bethlehem. That which is perfect came, and we didn't recognize it. In fact, Scripture says, and I read this last week out of John chapter 1. Jesus came into the world, and the world did not know him. He went to his own. He went to humans. He went to the Jews, all his own. They didn't recognize him. It's hard for us sometimes to recognize that which is perfect. But that which is perfect, that Jesus is, we only have to go back to 1 John to see where it says, God is love. God is love. That which is perfect, when it's come to us and we begin to, to understand fully, we begin to see fully, we begin to know fully, it only happens when love's in our heart. 
When Jesus came, he said, told his disciples, he's telling them he's going to go away, and they were lamenting that. You know, they were, they were upset. They were mad. Well, you can't leave yet, Lord. I mean, come on. Look at all the stuff you have got to do. I can see Peter now pulling him aside. Hey, G, you're not leaving. You can't go right now. What do you mean you're going to go to Jerusalem? You know they want you in. You know they want to hunt you down. You know they hate you in Jerusalem. You can't go there. And I'm not going to let you go there. I'm going to stand in the way of you going there. And Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. You only know in part. And he tells his disciples, and he tells them sternly, listen, you guys ought to be happy that I say I'm going away. Because if I go away, I'm sending one to take my place. He cannot come unless I go first. Because what I have in my heart, you can't have in your heart unless I'm gone out of here. The scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit coming down into our hearts gives us an understanding of love that we cannot possibly comprehend through the experiences of our life. I'm going to put some husbands on the spot. How many of you have a perfect marriage? How many of you have a perfect wife? Okay, you better raise your hand right now. Wives, how many of you have a perfect marriage? And how many of you have a perfect husband? Oh, boy. Uh, How many of you have perfect children? I mean, your children are just absolutely perfect. Thank you, Jeff. I agree with you 100%. The thing that makes perfection happen in your house is love. Perfection doesn't happen without love. The only way it can possibly happen to the degree that God intended it for it, for it to happen is by the Holy Spirit being present in your home, being present in your heart. And it all happened. All of that happened. The only way the Holy Spirit gets here to be able to be inside of human beings like me and you, the only way that happens is if Jesus comes. And he has to come exactly like us. Born of a baby, raised in a home. And I might say, if you haven't read the Gospels, Jesus was raised in kind of a dysfunctional home. He had as many problems in his house as you had in yours. Jesus had all kinds of things. I mean, he's out, the miracle worker of miracle workers. He comes back to his hometown. The first thing mom thinks is, man, I'm proud of my son. I hope he stands in the middle of the town and just heals everyone and and preaches a word that is just phenomenal. No, 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 no. She gathers brothers and sisters together and goes, hey, he's going to embarrass us. Go down and tell him just to come to the house. We'll have a little gathering of our own right here with just some close friends so he doesn't embarrass us on what's going on in town. So they go to Jesus. He's, He's in the middle of a meeting and he's telling people all about how wonderful his father is and and what he thinks of of mankind and how they're going to get out of all the law and all the prophets, the stuff that had been placed upon them, and they're going to be free. He's preaching the word to them. Somebody comes up and says, Hey, your brothers and your sisters are out there. They, They want to talk to you for a minute. Jesus... Looks around, who are my brothers and my sisters? Except for you that believe. Man, that had to be a tough home. (laughs) 
Jesus had to go through everything we went through. He had to go through every stage of, of life because he had to beat the devil at every plan, every opportunity. He had to overcome. He had to do it all and never, never, not one time violate the law because he was born a Jew. The only way that is possible is if he is love. If he is love. In 1 John, it tells us that the way that we'll be able to know that we are believers, it isn't by how often we attend church. You're not a heathen if you don't attend church. You're not a believer if you do. It isn't how many verses of the Bible you have memorized. It really isn't by anything that you do that is religious, in fact. What the scripture says about us as believers, that you will know that we have the Father's presence in our life and on our life, you will know we will ha that we have that by the love that we have one for another. In fact, Jesus says, this is my commandment. Love one another. Just love one another. The disciples thought they were going to get him. They were listening to the Pharisees and Sadducees speak and, and everything. And one of the Pharisees, we got a trap. This is a good trap. Well, this is the best trap. Teacher? What is the greatest commandment? You want to know what they were asking? What commandment can we do that we can get out of all the other ones? What one thing can we do to get out of all the other ones? Jesus says, oh, that's easy. The greatest commandment is this one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body. Ah. Oh. Man, I got that one. Oh, yeah, but the second is equal to it. If you have the first, you have to have the second. The second is equal to it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two, not on this one with a caveat to the second, on these two things hangs all the law and all the prophets. On those two things hang all the other law and prophets. Everything you were relying on to be righteous hangs on these two things. Love God and love each other. You see, when Jesus came down as the babe in Bethlehem, he didn't bring us a religion. He didn't bring us a religion. I know that our culture today, we get hung up on it. Well, you're religious. Oh, you're one of them church people. Oh, well, we don't want to get religious. Oh, well, we shouldn't talk about religion. Can't talk about religion and politics. We are allowed to talk about every disease that we know that's in our body. We are allowed to talk about all of our in-laws and outlaws. We are allowed to talk about our dogs and our cats. Although I have no idea by any, why anybody would talk about a cat. But we are allowed to do it. But don't talk about religion and politics. Why in the world we would ever put our faith in the Lord in the same category? With something we could absolutely not have any faith in. I say we talk about the Lord. Because he has nothing to do with religion. He has everything to do with love. You see, that's the greatest gift. That is the perfect gift. That is the gift that the Father says. He comes down from the Father of lights. Our love for each other in every manner, every way, every shape, every relationship. When the disciples ask him, ask Jesus, Lord, well, 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 then who, who is our neighbor? Who is the one? 
I mean, come on, you say love our neighbors as ourselves. Well, well, which neighbors are we allowed to pick? He tells the disciples and those listening, love those that hate you. Love them that despitefully use you. You mean that neighbor that isn't so nice? You mean that one person that I really can't stand? You mean the old lady that yells at me at the, at the store when I go in? You mean the people that I pass on the highway and they wave at me with one finger? You mean all of them? Yeah. Yeah. One of the first stories I ever read when I was reading, um, I started reading Christian books. You know, I gotten saved and I was reading the Bible and I couldn't understand King James English. It, it just wasn't collecting with me. So somebody said, well, try reading uh, some books, some Christian books. Maybe you'll pick up on some of the idea. Well, I got a hold of this book called Twice Pardoned. A guy by the name of Harold Morris who had been wrongly accused of committing a murder. The guys that actually committed the murder pointed him out and testified against him and said he did it. So he went to prison, the Georgia State Penitentiary. He wasn't saved, but he had a grandma that was praying for him all the time. She loved him. And he knew that. In the course of his time in the penitentiary, he found Jesus. He got so in love with Jesus... He decided he would start sharing that with the other prisoners who didn't really appreciate it. He got put into the infirmary as a worker there because the guards lo loved him and they wanted to keep him kind of safe. So they put him in there. In there was the worst prisoner that they had in the penitentiary. And they said, you need to feed him every day. He said, what do you mean I need to feed him? They said, you need to take him over his food. He said, why can't just anybody do that? And they said, not just anybody can do that. You need to. He had no idea why. He started taking food over to him. And as soon as he got close to him, the guy had a cane and he would whack him. And he just kept getting whacked. And he would just keep taking food to him. And the guy kept whacking at him with this cane and hitting him. And he said, man, it hurt. One day he goes to take food to him, and the guy doesn't whack him. And he takes the food, and he gives it to him, and he looks at the guy, and the guy's got tears rolling down his face. And he said, what's wrong? He said, I've done everything I could to hate you. And you keep coming and coming. How can you keep doing that? And he said, because of Jesus and his love for me, and his love for you. And the guy accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. And before the week was done, the guy passed away and went to heaven. That's what love will do. That's why it's the perfect gift and the greatest gift. Because it can overcome everything. That's what we see in our kids up here when they're singing. You can feel it in them. They just love. They love being here. They love being with us. They love church. That's who we are. We're love. Today, you're love. That's what your Christmas is going to be this year. Love. Unfettered. Let loose. That in-law that comes over you didn't invite? <laughs> hug them. Give them a present. Go get one of your presents and give it to them. And love on them. Because I believe in your house this Christmas season, you're going to see the love of God poured out like you've never seen before. People overwhelmed with your generosity, with your gifts, with your love. Taken back by the graciousness that God has put in you. And you're going to have every opportunity to share that hope of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen? Stand to your feet this morning.
God's good. Our kids were good today, weren't they? Oh, my goodness. We're going to see that on Facebook later? Oh, it's already on there. I'm thinking, man, you've got to be careful if you're preaching these days, you know, anything you could say or do. I was on Facebook Live. Oh, no. Facebook Live. It don't even take time to even post it. You just go direct to the whole thing, the whole world. They're watching while we're watching. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Praise the Lord. We want to share the love of God today. We want to bless. We want to bless our kids. Pray for them. We want to share the love of Christ with each other. What we got at the end here, Steve? Silent night. Silent night. It's on your instructions. I I know. <laughs> I didn't get the I didn't get to the bottom. I didn't get to the bottom line. One, two, and four. One, two, and four even. Oh, we yeah, know those by heart. We want to sing Silent Night. And as we do, listen, you're blessed. We will pray for you, and then we'll sing. Lay your hands on yourself. Lay your hands on your partner around you and people around you. And let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, around us today, Lord God, there are saints, saints of God, blessed people of God, people with great hearts, people, Lord God, with so much love in their heart for each other. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that the perfect gift fills their heart today, gives them a a day of gladness and a day of joy, that their Christmas this year, Lord God, is not just a time of opening presents and a time of people coming over that stay too long and eat too much. Father, that this Christmas would be a time for them when the love of God changes radically their entire house. Father, I pray, Lord God, that there would be wayward children that come home, wayward parents that come home. Father, that there would be people, Lord God, that haven't reconciled anything in their life with relatives and in-laws and outlaws and exes and all the other people that they have in their life in this Christmas, Lord God. Your love is going to break down all of the walls, all of the barriers, all of the hate, all of the hurt. And Father God, we thank you and we praise you because Jesus is able to do it all. We thank you for the offering today. We thank you for the people who give. They are blessed abundantly above all that they're able to ask or to think. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit on their life. Pour it out, Lord God. Increase them at every turn so that they are abundantly blessed. And we thank you and we praise you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. Let's sing Silent Night.